Boy, I thought I was already live and it turns out I was not. <laughs> I wasn't live at all. So I've opened up a model and I've already started talking about it, but let's just go over it again. A uh, couple shout outs. I thought I was talking to people and I wasn't in fact talking to people. So uh, let's just bring it up again. So a couple things, if this didn't make it into a live stream, just wanted to point out a couple people have purchased my templates and are talking about them and saying that they're still learning them. And that's awesome. Uh, really appreciate you guys purchasing these things. And yeah, again, I just want to say this again. I'm not sure if I was live or not. It seemed to me that I was not. So I want to state that uh, I am, in fact, meaning to go live. I hope that I am. If someone can confirm that I'm live right now, that'd be great. And here we go. So um, I get this model from Crystal Creek Builders. They're out of Arizona. And they said I was going to be excited about this. In fact, I am. This is a very cool model. And what I do is I always prep these models for render. Uh, so I get to review these models, take a look, do some graphical cleanup so that I can. Oh, thank you. Live now. That's good. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> I wasted the last 10 minutes. Uh, you need to know so much just to be able to get this stuff out to you guys, this content out. And I wanted to uh, do a shout out to both of you. I've seen um, both of your names uh, a couple times now in these feeds. And just to let you know, on the content creator side, it makes a huge difference to get post engagement. So uh, getting people to engage with us is the biggest challenge. It drives the content forward. We get, give you new information, the information you want to know. So that's huge. Thanks, guys, for being here and, and commenting. Um, so I'm reviewing this model. I took a quick look at it already. So you missed my initial response to it, which was happiness. I'm really happy getting to work on projects like this. Um, this is a very modern looking home, which is uh, very different from what I usually get from this client. We had some missing material files and I'm a, a jokester. So I always replace missing material files with, you guessed it, this file is missing. So kind of points these things out, lets me know if I need to replace them or not with something that's more appropriate. This particular client always has a lot of issues with my you know, wall intersections with building roofs, although they've been getting better at roofs. And then there's usually some errors in structure um, there's usually some errors where we've got some redundant symbols across multiple floors. And then there is always a ill-conceived kitchen. It's usually designed in plan view, marked up in plan view, and elevations are not considered. So I get to come in here, redesign these kitchens. Um, to tell you a little bit more about this builder, this project is already sold. The client has already purchased. They have options to upgrade. And so part of those options are whatever I may come up with in terms of design. And then we produce a video so that they have something to look at and review. Um, it can be a really emotional journey for these particular clients because these are typical, uh, typical of this, my client, is that their clients are uh, retirees. These are their homes that they're meant to retire in. And so it's usually a very emotional purchase for them. So producing these videos hits home. It's kind of a fun thing. So, and they build this into uh, their package. Um, it's a write off for them, I guess. And there you go. So uh, I take a look at this. I already replaced uh, the gutters with my own 3D gutters. I need to do a lot of material mapping and that's typical of twin motion. Uh, to give you an example, whenever I have a wall and that wall spans across multiple rooms, say this exterior wall goes from this wall uh, into the room that's adjacent, uh, it means in twin motion, you cannot contain material IDs based on room like we can in Cheap Architect. When you export to twin motion, every wall that has its own material ID has no distinguishing aspect to it to let twin motion know that it's different from one room to the next because there are no rooms in twin motion. This model becomes a dumb model. So I need to come in here and do some color coding and a few other things. The easiest way for me to do this is I'm going to import from a previous, um, import defaults from a previous plan that I've done for them. So we'll go to that previous plan. We're gonna import our default settings, which include material files 
And then I need to double check that we didn't screw anything up. And so I always make a copy of these before I do any, any work. So I'm working from a copied set of this plan. And let me get into a previous. And what we'll see, uh, one, immediately is that um, we're going to see some changes in materiality for all of the electrical symbols. That's a big one. Um, we're picking up some errors as we did this. So a room has a negative ceiling height. If you've got a 3D mouse, it's really easy to zoom out when you get these errors and you'll get a highlight, especially in X14. Um, so we got a highlight of where this problem issue is. So we got some issue here over in the garage area. That's fine. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Uh, but let's go back to our 3D and we're going to see that our electrical symbols should have changed colors. Same with some of our baseboards and our window and doors. So these, this color coding is so that I'm making sure that I have options for additional coloring when I take it into in motion. So you can see the exterior color of the windows is different from the interior. That gives me that option to do like a vinyl clad window. Um, the electrical symbols, I want to make sure that they are, in fact, their own unique color. Um, because when everything's white, it's really hard to double check that you've got everything appropriately colored. So, And then our next task here is I've got a bunch of style palette tools that are, go by room by room. And so I might go take a... Um, a view like this and just punch through room by room and we'll we'll tile these windows so you can kind of see what's happening. So we've got a garage. We're going to get this um, this room error a couple times. So actually I might want to go fix that room error first. So something's happening in this garage. Um, so let me just navigate my camera over there. And I could just drag this camera in um, our top down plan, but I actually like to carry it through using the 3D mouse to get a better idea of um, to familiarize myself with these houses, because uh, there's no way I can do my job without in brief in a brief amount of time understanding what these houses are, you know, how they're put together, what the intent of the original designer was. I don't have conversations with the original designer, so I just need to kind of live in these houses as quickly as possible. So it's nice to just navigate in 3D. So here we go. We've got a garage. It's clearly not um, built out as a garage. We've got two contained rooms. And it looks like you see how when I select on the ceiling, we got we have a division. But when I select the floor, there's no division meaning that somehow this floor is being picked up from the floor below. And that's probably where the error is coming from. So, yeah, we have a negative ceiling height. So somehow uh, he's stacked rooms and have, has them overlapping, um, which oftentimes for this particular uh, designer means that, yeah, in fact, he's trying to create a footing plan on one level and then kind of fake it till he makes it get it to that next level. So, um the CD set is not interesting to me anymore, so I'm going to switch to an intersected mode to select these walls. But before I do that, I want to make sure that I'm breaking the plane of anything that's outside of that garage. So I'm going to break this plane here, or break this wall, excuse me. And now we can select all of these walls using our intersected mode. Um, we could even do a, a select marquee similar and just highlight these walls. And we missed one of them for some reason. Okay. And then I'm going to do a cut. And in fact, it did pick up that overlap, which I'm not happy about. So let me make sure that this break comes through. So if I have the wall tool enabled, we're going to do a um, restrictive selection instead. And I'm hitting my number two key because I've got it bound to an intersected mode. So then shift select. And now I should have grabbed all those walls. You got it. Now I'm going to do a cut. And we'll take this up to the floor above, paste hole position. And we still have a negative ceiling height, but that's okay. We're going to get in here and make sure that we've got intersected walls. We've got a few overlapping things going on here. I'm just going to get rid of the error. Now I'll be able to fix it. Delete these disconnected walls. Now we should have a room here that we can set back to a default value. A lot of, uh, a big part of fixing these models is 
understanding um, whether or not you have the ability to work through whatever comes up after <laughs> after you set some things up, right? So, uh, you know, immediately we see the floor drop. That's kind of a funny thing. Um, and I don't know that I even need these footing walls intact, but let's see what's going on here. So we've got floor drop, floor above needs to go back to default. So our ceiling height's a little different. There we go. Now we're looking pretty true to probably what was originally intended. So our footings jumped up and, and maybe it would be nice to drop down our, it looks like this garage door is in fact sitting on the floor, but the floor's too high. It's not sitting down at grade, which means we'd have to grade up to it. So this would probably need a curb. I don't think that I need to distinguish that back room from the other room. Um, yeah, this is a bike shop. That's interesting. I might need to make a note of that because that's a that's a cool little detail. I'm gonna have to bring that forward. Maybe I'll just put a bicycle on the plan to remind myself. <laughs> so I'm gonna delete that wall. I just don't need it. It's not important to me. Um, Let's see what this comment is, though. I find when you don't modify a broken wall immediately after breaking it, it will default back to being whole again. Not sure why. Well, um, absolutely true, because your model is rebuilding. And by default, we're going to, you know what? I don't know the technical term. We can look it up real quick. But by default, that wall is going to reconnect when you when you rebuild your model. So um, I'm going to keep this comment up on the screen because I'm going to show you how we get around this in X14. In case you're interested, we can get into walls and get into our general wall. And now we have a auto merge collinear walls. I don't know if you can see this in the stream. It's probably tiny as all get out. Change um, to a magnifying glass here so I can put a magnifier on this. Auto merge collinear walls. We are in our general wall defaults. This is X14 only. So if I uncheck that, now it will not merge those walls. Little tip for you. Okay, so I don't really want to spend too much more time on this garage. I'll get back to it and work through some issues. I really do want to just get to some initial color coding because that's going to point to a bunch of other problems I might have. So in our plan view, I'm going to enable another toolbar that I have, and that's called rooms. And so I'll get in here and start painting these rooms out. Yes, it does cap me at 720p, Ethan. Um, unfortunately, that's the only way it will co-stream to Facebook and YouTube. So I know it's not fun not getting that bigger stream. It's helpful for me right now because I'm on a satellite internet connection and it's slow as molasses. So <laughs> got to bear with me. Um, I have to talk through menus because I know that you guys cannot see these menus. So, you know, maybe, maybe later on, I'll figure that out. <laughs> and so this is just color coding and, and you're late to the stream. I'll just tell you, this is kind of a necessary step for me to distinguish um, wall materials, one room to the next. So in fact, I'm going to bring up another 3D view for this. So this makes a lot more sense as I go through it. Maybe we'll just do the obvious ones in 3D. So well, obviously we've got a kitchen here. So I'm using room style palettes that carry with them materials so that we're color coding these rooms. And you know what? I'll do something that kind of benefits us all. Let me save this plan. We'll, we're going to change some preferences. We're going to pump up these icons. So at least you can see what icons I'm clicking on. And we'll relaunch.
This is kind of tedious work, just painting these rooms out. Now, trouble here is if I have these both painted as bath, then all of a sudden I can't change this one wall to be a different color from the next room. If it carries through, if the wall carries through past a perpendicular wall, then that would be an issue. In this case, I don't have a problem with this. I can paint it separate from this room. So no problem painting those both out as bathroom. The closet one's nice. It also changes the color of the floor so that we can properly um, paint that out in twin motion. And when we get close up to these colors, you can see here, this is helpful in twin motion as well. I get to actually see on the wall, what are these rooms? Understand what room I'm working with. Sometimes it gets confusing. It just cuts down on my time from jumping back to one platform to the next, understanding what's happening. It's nice to establish a workflow for, you know, whatever services you're offering. So um, as soon as you find redundant tasks in one uh, program to the next, it's nice to build out some tools to kind of tackle those problems. Anybody watching this, anybody here live, if you haven't picked them up yet, um, I do still have my closet tools up for free. Uh, they will not always be free. So if you haven't grabbed them, please go grab them. They make a big difference here. And most of my items, if you type in the prefix RD in your library, you'll come up with stuff that I've built. So RD Closet immediately brings me up with a bunch of closet tools here. And so I need a, a corner support on the one side. Oops, I turned around. Didn't it? And this is going to need kind of a floating end shelf. Same thing, kind of a floating end. There we go. Nice. Yeah, the closet stuff's cool. I also have some, um, it's easy enough to bring in clothing from like SketchUp and then um, compile them and bring them in as a block. So let's see, let me orient myself here. Where are we at? We're way over here. Okay. So then I'll just drop this block in. And pop it into place. There you go. Close enough. These videos are just snippet videos. So if you know what your end product's going to be with, you know, time and experience, if you know exactly how you're going to render out something, render out your video, then I can do some shortcuts and not focus too much on, on accuracy. Uh, it's a nice break from the norm when I don't need to be so specific and accurate in my models. So if I know I'm going to cut out some scenes or not show, you know, the full extent of something. Nice to know that I don't need to have these uh, clothing perfectly lined up to convey what I need to convey. Don't need to spend much time on it. Um, something I forget to do every once in a while. This is such a better imp an improvement to workflow. Let's grab a CAD line, draw your CAD line 45 out from your wall, and then it's simple enough to just grab these clothings, duplicate it, and then reflect about that CAD line. 
Only problem is sometimes you can't quite hit that cad line on the mark. But there we go. That was so much easier to do it that way. That's why I like to call this a casual session. I try not to be as fast. <laughs> and then if you see how this is on a diagonal, if we explode this block and then redo the block, it used to be a trick for being able to redo it so that it wasn't on that um, on this pivot, essentially. I have to look that up again. Mind blown again. Okay, is that just about the reflect about? That is such an improvement to your workflow, just being able to use inference lines like that. Um, man, I really, it's nice. I started doing it with just doing manual roofs, just being able to do that. Um, just to reflect about at a diagonal it makes such a huge difference. And we'll probably redesign these cabinets. They're looking a little sad, but for now, I'll leave it. Um, I wanna make sure that I'm um, opening up these doors. It's nice to you know set this to default once you've got these open. I like to do 96%, kind of lets you see that it's a pocket door and at the same time, have it be open enough that you can walk through it. Um, keep in mind in twin motion, this is a, this is an important note. I need to figure out some way to put timestamps on this, but a big, big issue in twin motion is that, and it's from chief architect's side, is chief architect binds your hardware to your jam and casing. Say that again. Chief architect binds the hardware or the mesh of that hardware to your casing so that when you export it and you want to open a door using some kind of uh, trigger mechanism, some kind of physics-based tool, you'll be opening your hardware with your casing. Your casing will pivot with your hardware, which is not desirable. So what do you have to do? Well, you either have to ditch the hardware entirely, which is what I do because it's okay if I'm not showing hardware to my clients. Uh, but if I do need to show that hardware, then I need to take it into another software and, and break up that component stack so that the hardware is pulled outside of our jam and casing. Or you can completely erase, in the case of Twin Motion, erase the casing and the door panel and everything and use one of Twin Motion's built in operable doors. But that can still be challenging too. So um, it is helpful to kind of go in, go through your model, figure out what doors you need to have open. Um, we're seeing a lot of pocket doors here. So, uh, and of course, probably the fastest thing to do is come in here and let's see if we've got a distinguishing factor between a restrictive tool selection, uh, and a select marquee similar. So, um, if we choose our pocket door tool, can we only pick up pocket doors using our shift marquee select? Let's open these up. And in fact, that opens up all doors. So not very helpful. Now, if we do a select marquee similar, right? Do that same thing. Does it pick up? Nope, it does not. So no distinguishing factor from door types. So that's a big problem. Unfortunate as it is. Um, do I have any other tools for doing that? Not really. So I kind of have to go through and hand select these things. I do have a um, I do have a note about that in Chief's suggestions. Oh, we just had an earthquake. Oh, big earthquake. That was a big earthquake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're telling me. <laughs> We've got a lot of a lot of people yelling out out back right now. <laughs> Noted about the hardware encasing. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one to note. Boy, I'm a little flustered right now. That was big. <laughs> you didn't see me move very fast either. I should have jumped and ran for the heavens. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you for checking in. I think we're good. <laughs> A little shaking going on. I'm from California, so we're used to earthquakes, but not not typically in Costa Rica. Not that I knew of. You know, we're over there in Alaska. Yeah, cool. Okay, so let's see. Interior. What do we have here? This is interesting. I didn't know that our barn doors had a swing angle. Oh, it doesn't. It's just that I'm selecting the wrong thing. So, yeah, I got to go in here one by one, pick these things up, open them up to 96. Um, and you know what? I think this is coming for you. I know a couple of you guys watching this. Um, a couple of you guys watching this have my templates. And this is something I'm, I think, need to, I think needs to be changed in the new version of them in an update. Uh, we should be getting a, a public release of X14 pretty soon. And, and so I'm holding off on some of the fixes that I already have noted for those templates. And one of those fixes is that I do not think that I have these doors, these pocket doors open to 96 by default, um, which is something I want to change. So that'll be on there. If you guys have my templates and you have um, some ideas or changes you'd love to see, and they'll always be considered. Um, keep in mind that these templates are built to be used across interior designers, decorators, um, people that are just brainstorming. They're really meant to be used by a lot of different professionals. So uh, sometimes these changes never make it in, even though they sound like good changes because they're not um, beneficial to the group as a whole. So in that case, it's helpful for me to just explain to you how you can make your own changes in those cases. Um, but yeah, this is one of them is I'm going to open up all those doors uh, to a greater extent. So here we go. we got a bedroom office, which I like to label these as study. If we've got multiple bedrooms and one of them is labeled as partial study, then I want to change this to an office type. Ethan, you're over in Arizona. You get earthquakes? Let's see. Bedroom two office, bedroom three. What's your guys' take on this master bedroom business? Boy, that's a hot topic. That's a hard rewiring for me. Here's Ethan's response to his earthquakes. No, sir, thank goodness. Or two over the last five years. Yeah, all right. I have some uh, family in the Midwest, and when they come in and, and experience an earthquake, it is terrifying <laughs> for them. Yeah, especially some of these structures. I'm on a deck right now, and I don't know if I can even swing this. Let me see if I can swing this. These are the supports for the deck. <laughs> so <laughs> I probably felt a little bit more movement. <laughs> got some tree supports let me see if i can get that on camera a little bit more here we'll take it we'll pause for a second and this fun if we never streamed never did any live streaming what would we know about this kind of stuff yeah look at that cool cool stuff a lot of the structure here in costa rica they're um they're keeping these timber details but they're they're just a facade um, so they're doing steel structure, but then uh, spending the extra time and effort and money to, to put in some fake timber. Um, kind of cool. <laughs> I'm just assuming this laugh out loud is, is for the... <laughs> For, for the structure here. 
Okay, so the upper floor mainly mainly put the spec. And let's go, maybe, let's look at the lower floor. Let me just drop it down a level. We'll get that automatic cut from this overview. This is supposed to be some kind of workout room. Let's see what else we've got. Another bedroom. Pool house. Another bedroom with a concrete floor. So might need to work that out. I don't know. Didn't need to work it out. Weird. So here's the next thing. Boy, I feel like I'm just selling my own stuff here. I'm not meaning to. It's just my stuff is primarily built for this workflow. So showers, the shower tools I've got just make this uh, such a nicer experience. Because I get projects like this where this is the extent of his shower is he drew a, you know, he just drew a shower pan. That's his shower. Oh, and something's here. What's left over? Oh, and another, and another shower pan, too, just in case you, <laughs> you're stocking them. Uh, so it's easy for me to come in here and drop a new shower in here. Let's see if I figure out, orient myself to that. Where was that? Oh, it was right here. So yeah, bring the shower toolkit in. Area too constricted. That's okay. It'll still drop it. It'll do something weird. Uh, this is a glitch in Chief that's been in Chief for as long as I can remember. I need to place my only known solution is placing another architectural block, and then, and then I can go select this first architectural block. Although not always. So weird, weird glitches. You can see the architectural block is placed, but you couldn't select it because it was in a constricted area. And you know what? Thank you. And I think you should. And I think it makes up for itself in short order. Um, yeah. So, yeah, this stuff is built to make us money. Let's make some money. And also, if I'm being honest, it was built to make my job experience pleasurable. Really. You're laughing at Ethan. <laughs> Yeah, second floor. Uh, yeah. Feel kind of helpless. Well, it's like you're on a vacation and and everything's great until you realize your life's in some other um, set of standards, hands, right? Architectural standards when Mother Nature takes in. So part of this, uh, people can always rebuild this system, by the way. Um, the biggest part of this system is that it hinges on... Um, use of a backsplash tool. I wanted to make it easier to draw a backsplash and have it do exactly what I wanted it to do. And so to do that, you needed a zero inch cabinet. So if we open up what looks like nothingness, that's exactly what it is. It is a cabinet though. It's a base cabinet and it just has, um, there's nothing to it. It's a zero inch cabinet, but because you place a zero inch cabinet, now all of a sudden you can snap a backsplash to that cabinet. That was the whole point. Not even that you can snap to it, you can single click and place a um, backsplash based on that tool. So um, I did just draw this wall, which does create a room. So, and that was probably a little bit backwards. A faster workflow is um, drawing that wall four inches in from this cabinet. Let me bring this um, cabinet three or four inches out. I'm gonna say four, oh shit, not 45 four inches so that's going to be 41 back so now that i have that drawn i can um i can actually use the backsplash tool right now and then single click on my walls and it's going to bind it's going to bind to that cabinet right and then once i have that it's simple to draw my new shower curb wall inside of that There we go. And maybe I want to align it a little bit better. Now, once that's all set up, then you can use the room style palette tool to paint this into a shower room and it's going to create a mortar bed and it's going to kind of unify the textures in there. And then of course we've got that shower door. 
that's stretchable. And very quickly get to a shower that makes sense. Um, I'll talk just for a second about my wall niche tool. So this is a fixture that we're using. And if you already know your tile layout, this is really nice because you can actually size this to line up with your grout lines. That's cool, especially for the interior designers, right? So um, placing this, oh, you know what? It was wanting to push up against the backsplash. Sometimes this is easier to place in uh, 2D and then um, kind of work on those locating. What we say here, I think they laughed at my comment that didn't pop up. <laughs> oh, now, yeah, I see it. <laughs> gotcha. I missed it. <laughs> uh huh. Did I, did I make a face? I probably made a face. <laughs> uh, he was laughing at Ian. Let's see, cabinets, cabinet tools are crazy, man. Crazy. We talk about cabinets because. Oh, dive in on cabinets. That's a that's a tough one to really wrap your head around. Oops, I got us out of frame here. What happened? Cabinets, you have um, the ability to join parametric modeling with stretch zone based modeling. And to really set that home I'd, I'd like ask you guys to think about that for a second and realize the implications of, of what we're even talking about when we say that like um oh this is interesting i this is the first time i think i've painted the backsplash first before the niche and so the niche isn't cutting the backsplash so what if i delete it and then undo let's see what happens see if it cuts for that backsplash it does there you go quick trick delete the backsplash rebuild it it's going to cut around that um, that wall niche we just made. Perfect. Um, probably want to center this on the room, but okay. So back to cabinets, we can parametrically, parametrically model. We can, we can set fixed dimensions on any element within a cabinet uh, in terms of its face, sides, back, right? We can completely replace frames. We can, um, we can make a zero inch frame. We can, um, so zero inch frame, and then you can replace a door and with stretch zones and your, um, bounding box modifications, you can make the door become a new cabinet box. So you can design your own custom cabinet box, if you will. Um, let's see if I can give an example of that. What would I even give as an example? Well, I've got a few symbols that are based on it. The fireplace tools are based on that, um, thought process. So. Uh, you can do a lot of crazy stuff and then parametrically resize um, knowing that you have the limitations of stretch zones on any symbols that you've added, which symbols might be doors, door panels, millwork, um, pilasters, that kind of thing. So um, there are some restrictions, but the cabinets are some of the most versatile tools in the software. And I don't think Chief even knew just how powerful they were when they were creating them. Okay, so here we go. This belongs on one of those architectural forum, right? <laughs> Installed the toilet wrong. Uh, Need of the wax ring from the toilet below. Here we go. Let's delete that out. Some open some doors up. Um, I can't wait till their open door. Let's see. Do we get an open door style palette tool? I'm not sure that you can do that. It'd be nice to know if we can. So let me do this. I'm going to open this door to 96 inches, and then I want to save it as a style palette and see what designations I can make, right? So we'll make a create a new, and I'm going to type out that this is a open door wider style palette tool. <laughs> and then hit the set properties. Let's clear all. And then I want to look at maybe percent. Here's my biggest gripe with style palette tools. Um, there's the quality control was really lacking when they made this setup. So um, they have a lot of naming conventions that need to be conformed across the full system. So when I type in percent, nothing comes up, maybe open. 
Maybe we can just get open. Uh, let's see, ref opening. Nope. So we we don't get anything from typing in open. We don't get anything from typing in percent. Um, maybe if we type in 3D. Is drawn closed in 3D? Let me type that in the comment. Is drawn closed in 3D? Like, are you kidding me? That's really what we're calling it? Although, even though that's not named like that anywhere else. Here, we'll check some macros too, by the way. We'll, we'll like see if this conforms to some macros. So, is drawn and closed in 3D. So, we can't get a percentage of... Let me just do a quick scroll through and see what other settings we have. And I'm looking for 96 inches because that's what I... Or 96 because that's what I just said, percentage of open. So, we can't set um, percentage of open yet, which is a big shame. So we can't make a tool based on that. Too bad. Now that we have open door wider as a tool, it doesn't actually work like that. It's just going to be renamed to open door. Once you create a style palette, it can be applied. Let me just pin that for a second. It's drawn close in 3d. It can be applied on a object level, room level, floor level, plan level. So in this case, we'll just do it on a room level. When I paint the room, that means I need to hover over the room. I'm not going to hover over the object. If I'm in the object painter mode, I need to hover over the object. Let me change my um, color preferences so we can see this a little bit better because right now it's on blue and we have blue casing and it's hard to see. So uh, selection line, we'll change it to maybe like a neon green. Okay. So when I hover over the room, that enables that tool. But if I change to object painter mode and hover over the room, nothing's going to happen. I need to hover over the door. It will change it on a door by door base. Now here is the weird thing in chief is that when I hover over this other door, which is a different door type, it will not apply. That's a screw up chief. Sorry. I don't care what you say. That's absolutely not functioning correctly. Uh, because we cannot distinguish something being open based on a percentage on a door by door basis, we have no selection tool based uh, on a door type by type basis. Uh, so why are we having a door type by type basis restriction on our style palette? Doesn't make any sense. So unfortunately, I can't just paint out the whole room and have everything open up. Lame. So I need to go back and make a separate tool for these different items. Guess what? You can't do that. We only have an interior door class versus an exterior door class capability in style palettes. Hoping this stuff changes. I'm just letting you know if you come to the point where you want to do some of this advanced stuff where you're creating tools, style palettes and doors are really, really lacking. We've got a lot of conformity issues. So, And then here we go. We've got a design issue. Why are we opening this door up in front of this bath here? This might be something I take note of and go back to the client and say, hey, this is this is a big issue for me. And it might be a big issue for your client is that we're opening this door up either into the cabinet or into the bathroom, blocking the bathroom. This is just odd. Why are we not using some kind of a pocket door? This is the case for a pocket door. This isn't going to be a bearing wall. So what are we doing? Um, I might just change it. And my maybe that slips by the, the client. I don't know. I don't know if they work these details out in the field or what. That's that's a much better scenario there. In both cases, this pass through is just that's a pain. They might need this to be a plumbing wall though. So there there's an issue on this side. Um, do you switch to a barn door or do you just do better design? Better design. Okay, moving on. I know, it's long-winded on that. So I'm gonna end up redoing these vanities, redesigning the vanities. I'm gonna end up changing these um, these vanity lights. Uh, this is a modern house. We might wanna go for a modern fixture. Um, typically, I just have kind of generic vanities that I use for this client. I don't think I have a great vanity library, so we might actually take the time to go make some new vanity lights for this project. Um, yeah, my vanity lights are pretty Pretty vanilla, honestly. So might actually go make some vanity lights and get to that. Oh, here, let's do it. 
this is asked this is, a, this is a big question for a lot of people oftentimes they want to know how to get a better sketchup 3d warehouse workflow to lighting right so um i like to use my search tools we'll get into uh, a model search i like to start here um and then something that's great about the model search is I can restrict this. Um, this is built into my website. If you guys haven't seen this yet, go check it out. It's cool. It's free. You know, it's there. Pin it to your bookmarks. Um, so this is just an image image based model search. Um, and if we go back to my website and we actually get into that page, that model search page, if you scroll down. Um, you can see some additional resources here. And I also kind of list what this model search is searching from. So 3D Warehouse CG Trader, not all of these are free models. So it's nice to know uh, if we get back to that image search that we can actually restrict based on uh, just 3D Warehouse and Sketchfab or CG Trader. So I need to go back to the web tab and then I can click on the 3D Warehouse tab and then I'm getting a restrictive search just in that tab. Um, but let me go back to the image. And maybe I want to see a modern vanity light. Oh, we're just we're going to try to end up with something pretty quickly here. This is a pretty symbol, but that's probably a oh, free 3D. Cool. Click, click, see what we got here. Oh, no, it's it's not free. So let's go to 3D Warehouse and just get something free here and, and work through it real quick. Now, this is different from those people that have HD Pro. And unfortunately, my stuff I teach is never really um, of benefit to those 3D Pro people. But you guys are all watching on YouTube. I don't think this is streaming to Facebook, unfortunately. I think we missed that opportunity. All right, Vanity Light we've got here let's go modern vanity light and give you some light tips and a lot of questions about lighting tips um, for for chief so uh, that's an art light it's not really a modern light let's see you guys got a link to a cool light you want converted now's the time you got you got two minutes to get it to me <laughs> uh, let's see I can do kind of a hanging hanging globe fixture that might be cool. Um, models collections, let's keep going. That's kind of modern, but not really. Uh, yeah, not my pick, but we could deal with that just to show you guys an example. I might go replace this later. Um, this one's kind of interesting. It's not gonna show up well. These softwares uh, that are doing live uh, ray tracing PBR stuff, they're not the best on doing um, caustics and reflection reflection with a light source and a um, glass material. It's just a very complicated thing to work through. So you're gonna get a lot of ray trace fireflies when you pick something that's heavily glass. And unfortunately that's like limiting our design, right? That sucks. So, um, okay, so I'm gonna just pick one. Let's go. Yeah, I kind of like this one. Why not? I'm going to do a, an older model. And this is an easy workflow, by the way. I might take this into a folder that is just my send and delete folder or to process folder. In this case, we're going to process it right away. So I'm just going to send it to a send and delete folder. This is a workplace improvement for me organizing my fo uh, folders. What I'm trying to say is that this model is not the model I'm going to end up with. So I don't really want to save it yet. So what I'll do is I'll drag and drop this in the chief. I could use the import dialog box, but what that's going to do is take me through a dialog that I can't drag and drop. And I like the drag and drop feature. So once I drag and drop, I can place this on the wall. And then from there, this is just a preference of mine. From there, I can convert it to a symbol that's an electrical symbol. So I need to change the symbol class to electrical. I'm going to show advanced uh, options. We will add it to the library, even though it might need to get modified a couple times before it gets added to the library. Who knows? Let's press OK. Here we go. Electrical, modern light one, whatever we want to call it. Grabs modern uh, vanity light. 
I like to name these things. Uh, what's this project called? Fowler. So we'll name it Fowler. Or not. That's a simple one. Um, once we change it in the options panel to a light in the options section, don't you love these redundant naming conventions? Options panel, options section of your symbol, electrical symbol class, we're going to designate it as a light. Once we do that, unbeknownst to you, there may be an offset that's built from that uh, in your 3D panel in the origin offset section. So just to know, that's something that can happen. Uh-oh, stream quality. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't. Um, I could pump up my screen a ton. I know the stream quality is super low. I'm trying to talk through these menu items as best I can. Let's see if we can change the, uh, makes it challenging to work, but let me do it anyways. Let's make our display. Oh, we're going to pump this up to 175. This is going to be like working on my grandmother's computer screen. There we go. You're going to be able to see a little bit better here. My toolbars are going to be overwhelmingly big. <laughs> let's save this and let's rescale the toolbars now. It's good. It's good feedback. It's good to know. Okay. So what's our, our icon size again? Where was that done here? Button size. Let's go down to an 18 pixel button. Relaunch. All right. Fair enough. Maybe I'll leave menu items up there longer so that I can uh, kind of hash that out. Ethan, it sounds like you've got some networking experience. It's good. Going to need you to be on these calls always. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know what it is? I figured out what it is. We got an issue here. Look at that. This is the issue. We've got OneDrive is trying to upload my user library every time I shut it down which is huge. So hopefully we've, we'll get some improvement here. In fact, we'll turn off Dropbox too. Oops, wrong button. Only problem with turning these on is if you've got like a selective sync set up, it's difficult to um, pull models that might be in your selective syncs. Okay, let's see if I can get my feedback in front of me. Here we go. He's a professional Googler. All right, we're back to it. Let's see if I can go back to what I was trying to do. Oh, well, that's right. We're working on this vanity light. Let's get back into this. So this got added to the library already. So I need to go find that. That stream quality a little bit better now, maybe? Maybe it is. So here we are. We're going to open this up in the symbol class. I want to make sure that we've got everything set right in the options panel. And cool. Much better. Nice. Good. Um, I'm going to change this to wall mounted. Once these got, once we have this on wall mounted again, note, look what happens in our offsets. Yeah, uploads are crippling it. Um, Chief wants to think that when you um, change to a wall-mounted fixture or if you change to a ceiling-mounted fixture, it's going to offset. Um, in the case of the wall mount fixture, it's assuming that you're going to have a junction box in there, which is kind of a funny thing. So it's going to automatically offset. And then for the wall, uh, for the ceiling mount, it thinks you're going to offset by the total Z height of the fixture. So kind of funny there too. 
Um, so let's see, our Z position is unnecessary, zero inches. And in fact, we want a zero inch. There we go. So we're pinning this, our zero is a little bit off of center here. So we might actually want a little bit of movement in the Z axis to center this up. So it's gonna be a negative one, something like that, maybe negative three quarters. You can see here, I'm looking at the right side, centering this portion up to the center of that. Um, what'd you call that? It's, it's not really an escutcheon trim ring over your J box. And so once we've got this, this is pretty much it for the symbol side of things. Um, maybe in some cases, you know, for this particular symbol, you might want to set a couple of um, stretch planes. Uh, so we could set a couple stretch planes to be in between uh, the middle cone and the outside cone. So we could set something like maybe a four inch to get past that trim and then a negative four inch. So we can stretch in between, you know, stretch from those two areas. I'm gonna set it to five inch. It looks like it might be a better setup there. Um, so we could do a little bit of symbol modification, not much. Um, so that's it in terms of the uh, symbol classification edit. And then we need to get in and open up the, on the component level. And so here's where we're gonna get to our light data panel. And let's just, in our options section of the light data panel, I wanna show position in camera view, which is at the bottom of the screen. And we're locating where our light source is. And you can see here, it's right now it's set to be a spotlight. I actually want it to be a point light. So, or excuse me, I want it to be a spotlight. It is a point light. So there we go. Once we designate it as a spotlight, we get a directional area arrow. It's a kind of a funny 3D arrow um, that Chief came up with. And it's pointing us to the direction um, that our light trajectory is. So uh, we're going to need to change our tilt angle to a negative 90 degrees. That's going to point that light source down. You can see it's pointing down. Now we need to fix some of these offsets. Um, so in our offset section of the light data panel, uh, from the base, I want to drop this down, the source down, so that we get the kind of the gimbal center position where we're seeing um, all the axes in red lines. Uh, we're going to set this down maybe uh, negative four inches. Oh, excuse me. It wants to call the base in the wrong plane there, negative four inches in the Y. There we go. And now we want to bring this, okay, away from that base, four inches. That gets us towards the center of that first cone, maybe four and a quarter. A lot of guess and check here, unless you actually go in with CAD lines or pull a section view and, and get this stuff exact, which we can do. Let's show you what that looks like real quick, because this is another bit of info that people don't know about. When you pull a section camera, Let's pull it right through this symbol. In fact, I'll pull a back clip section camera so we get a really clean symbol here. I'm gonna pull it right through the center of the symbol and then perpendicular to that symbol. When you pull a section camera, it's actually gonna create section lines on items that it is splitting based on what is it, the class or something like that. So we might be able to get a couple of snap zones if we have uh, that symbol turned on, which in this case, I don't care what we've got going on in this section view. I'm just going to turn all layers on. It's going to show us a bunch of extra stuff. But what we will pick up is that camera, wherever that is. I mean, excuse me, this. Now I just need to make sure I'm turning labels off. Get those labels out of the way. But yeah, we could figure out what that offset is by doing it this way. Yeah, we're not in fact picking up any section cuts. We're only picking up the floor section cuts, architectural element section cuts. So here's our offset. And here's a cool trick. This is in my YouTube, um, a quick way of getting a dimension really fast. Use the line tool, hit your tab or enter key, copy this number, and then just hit cancel. It deletes the line. And that way we can go in here, open our object up and set that offset in the Y position based on that copy, four and seven eighths, gets us to the center of that fixture. Simple, simple stuff.
So now we're perfect center on that fixture. Very cool. We can do the same thing for the offsets from left to right because we're going to do um, two more light sources. Now, keep in mind, this doesn't help at all in twin motion. We're replacing all the lights in twin motion anyways. This is just about you know bringing in a light that you might want. So um, our direction is correct. I want the... Um, Oh, you know what? I pasted this in the wrong zone. This was negative four, but I actually wanted this to be my paste. There we go. Now we're center. And maybe we'll make this negative three. We'll push it up in that cone a little bit more. And then our X position is going to come into play when we duplicate this light source. So we're going to add another light based on that last light. And then we just need to edit here. Let's do four and let's do eight. Yeah, that gets us close. 11 looks like maybe 10 and a half. You got one at 10 and a half, add another light, negative 10 and a half. Okay. So this is electrical service specification. Keep that in mind, which means that we get to edit our height off the floor. Cool. I want to turn off those positions in camera view. So I got to go light by light, turn off that show position in camera view and get into our general panel height to center and set this to whatever it needs to be. Boy, I'm going to have to check my own references. I usually just reference a, a CAD block that says exactly what my height to center should be. 74 inches, something like that. Now, now that that symbol is, that's complete, we've named it. Um, the last thing I want to do is add some search attributes. This helps organize your library over time. Um, nice to come up with a system that you can stick with. In my case, it's going to be RD light. And I might type in RD vanity and RD MEP. And then I want to put rab, rabs. That's kind of redundant. I don't think it's necessary. Um, and then I might put light, vanity, etc. So it'll pick up any of these search terms. And then when we place it, it should place automatically at that specified height off the floor. Um, if you've got your snapping done correctly, there we go. Just like that. Bam, we got a new light. Last bit is I might change the materials on this. Um, so that they're better materials, not necessary right now. Um, so what ends up happening is I put these uh, items into to process a folder in my library. And that means that I've got something left to process until it's ready to distribute in a package for you guys to buy or purchase or me to give away. So last bit of this is we get to click on this and in X14, we got that cool replacement toggle and bam, finally got a light. <laughs> it's a long winded approach, but all right. Type in my RD mirror, I get some mirrors here. Um, and since we're going for a modern look, maybe we'll go for this guy. Boy, that door is just distracting as all heck, huh? So anyways, let's work through some other stuff of more interest to you guys, maybe watching this. Uh, we've got a stairwell here, might just call this the hall room. Although that's a hall, so maybe that was a bad idea. Doesn't matter, it can be just, the living room is fine. Notice the orientation of the floor is going to have to get uh, fixed. I'm not going to spend time fixing that in chief. I'll fix that out in twin motion. And I'll probably guess that this stone facade hits on this side here. Look at this. Bet you anything this is a piece solid. Yeah. That's a piece solid. Isn't this funny? So, I mean, this is the guy just doesn't, whoever designed this doesn't necessarily know some of the tools we've got available for us. Let's see if we can figure this out. What do we have here? Uh, we have, let's get into our wall types. Yeah, we don't have a pony wall. So let's get into our rail, um, our Newell's balusters panel. And he's got a 48 inch height overall rail. 
and then he's raised it 24. So what he needed to have was two 24 inch wall sections. So we'll get into our wall types. We'll hit up a pony wall. Let's do um, a stem wall is easy. So we'll change it to a stem wall. Um, we're going to make it a 24 inch elevation. We'll get into our rail style, uncheck raised bottom. And then our Newell's balusters is going to change back to 24. So now we've conformed it to what he was trying to accomplish. Let's take a look what that looks like. And we get the benefit of adding a cap. And you can see here we've got, you know, a little bit of goofiness in the offset. We can fix that. We can center it. Let's see. Line pony wall at main layer. No, we want to do wall center. There we go. And then we can get rid of that P line and just draw this around the corner. A little more versatility, more of a polished look. We're going to have to get way up here if we want to do it in 3D. Platform based modeler. Have to get above the platform to be able to draw out these walls in 3D. And I might have to tab in to get this P line. That's still a wall. Let's see, P line, P line, no. Nope. And we got an alignment issue with the foundation below. We can line these up. Although that didn't help anything. That doesn't look right. Let's undo that. Let's get into 2D and see if I can't get those P lines out of there. Yeah, there it is. There, quick fix. I'm going to leave this the way it is. It just gives me the opportunity to do maybe a better cap. And maybe we'll even make it a larger cap in case this was supposed to be some stonework. Um, if we're looking at notes, I don't see any notes on this railing. So this just gives us some, some options and versatility, right? So we might lower... Here's what I'm going to do. We'll select all these. I don't need to select all. We could have just redrawn the way we did before, but um, I'm going to lower the height of this off the floor by, let's call it three inches. So 21, we're going to raise our rail three inches. And then my wall cap, I'm going to add some height oh so i did that wrong actually it automatically cuts our lower that's new i learned that just now um all right so back up to 24 there we go no raise that's what we want so now that i can now i can do um now i can do some color coding for that make it like a brick ledge looks like we still have Bad, but down level, up a level. No, it's maybe not. This is just so that I can change the color in twin motion easily. Oh, and look at that. It pointed out an issue. Look at what the issue is. The wall cap's the same as the rail. Look at that. It makes the lower rail disappear, too. Oh, no, it didn't. It's still there, but strange that it wants to be that same color. Interesting. And because we have two adjoined, here's a great note. We have two adjoined surfaces. So what ha ends up happening in twin motion is because these are joined and they're the same material ID, I would not be able to paint these separately, which is a big problem. So um, I do, in fact, need to raise up that rail just enough to lift it away from the surface below so that they don't um, become adjoined, which 
Yeah, I should be able to do that. So we'll raise it like a eighth of an inch. Oh, you're not going to see a difference here, but that'll make a difference later on into a motion. And we've got a fire pit here. I've got to remember to put this back, but I'm not going to use this because this doesn't look real. So I'll end up having to build this out of a dome or something like that. Um, we have some kind of an iron texture, texture here. So let me just paint it like a brush nickel. See if I can just catch the frame. I don't know what the heck this is built from. So we've got no grid here. It's kind of funny. In this solid eight foot door type garage. I don't have to do a lot of these, so this might be challenging. Doors and doorways, garage doors, door panels. I mean, that's better, but not great. Those are modern doors. Wait, I don't really know how to do this. You guys know how to do this? Make a custom gridded garage door to your own spec? That's kind of challenging. Do we get to do um, our own muttons on these things? Let's see. I mean, that's kind of what we're looking for, but not quite. Glass panel. Yeah. Really all we get, huh? We have a bonus catalog for this stuff? That's terrible. Okay, so... with lights like this. Aha. It's a four by four grid. And let's color cut this something else. Probably closer with what he was looking for. Basically what we did, yeah. All right, let's get to the full model, see what's happening here. What else do we have to fix? So we have some wall connection issues. These are always a pain. Aren't these a pain? The roof's cutting the wall. You've got the wrong wall type. It's different type from up above to below. It's this little section right here. See, he's got an interior wall meeting two exterior walls. And in fact, this should be out like this. I don't know what is... What is this wall? This wall's got some crazy thick surface on the interior side. Who knows what it is? Stucco 6, but it's got something else pumping up the inside. Or we've got, oh, we've got an alignment issue here. So, floor below, floor above. Yeah, we've got all kinds of problems here. I'm going to say this one wants to align with floor above. And this is just for video representation, so okay, that fixed part of that. I don't know what this is. What is this? Oh, it's a landing. Okay, so we've got some alignment happening here. We've got a problem in this corner. See what happens when we color coat this. Just 
want to kill this molding here. And so we've got an interior wall that needs to be an exterior wall oriented the correct direction and it's being hidden in some kind of interstitial space, right? Yeah, don't need to do that. Okay, I have it. Uh, so this needs to be exterior on the one side going up as it meets the roof line. Basically, this wall here needs to reverse once it gets to here. And then line up on the main. What's happening here? What is this wall? I'm in the wrong zone here. What are we looking at? This stuff takes time, huh? Let's talk about exterior six. Doesn't have the coloring. Our joiner is off. What is this wall? That wall's unnecessary, it seems like. Even though it says it's a building. So he has his platforms incorrect. So his plate lines are wrong. This is bringing up all kinds of challenges. If you build the model correctly, your plate lines would be right. And then we wouldn't have platform intersection issues. Oh, so we've got a set of walls here that are aligning. Challenging. I don't feel like this is really fun to even watch. You guys still there? Forensics? <laughs> yeah, what a pain though. Um, all right, so at some point it's just not worth your time. Just rebuild it. I almost want to just do that like figure out exactly what's happening here. The balloon through might help a little bit. So we saw that a wall just deleted. That kind of helped understand what was even happening. So the balloon, so we're up on another level that I don't care about. That's what's happening here. So I need to get down a level. This is what I care about right here. So this is my exterior wall that needs to come through. And the main wall layers need to align. Like so. And then this needs to flip. Actually, it needs to flip. That's right, please. Main wall layer needs to align now. And, which is challenging. Let's turn off line weight so we can see. Yeah, main wall layer is aligned. Now I can designate this as. Um, see wall type if split by a budding roof that's wall that's wall auto return I might not know what that is where is that I think they changed the where this lives I 
Where is wall type if split by a budding roof? Roof return. Combine with above wall. That's a funny one. I like this. Let's try that. Um, but what else? I'm missing some options here. No wall types. Wall cap. Wall covering. What's happening here? Why do I not have the option? Vertical split framing, frame through, bearing wall, use from reference, between wall frame, roof, extending roof cuts, wall at bottom. Huh, I don't see this. I have to look at this up. We still don't have this appropriately colored either. Man, what a challenging scenario. That's correct. It's this for some reason is not not the line. Huh. I have to come back to this, guys. This is, I could sit on this for a minute. I don't know what's going on here. It's a funny little scenario. I can't get this to break right. Even though this shows is lined up on the floor below, this shows is lined up. Look at that. The wall, main wall layer is lined up. So the drywall layer, and this is showing as drywall. But it's not because it's siding. So I can't get a wall type is split by budding roof for some reason. Don't know where that exists. Might even hit the F1 key. All right, I'm going to move on. Let's see, what else do you guys want to see in this workflow? I just have to work through this and end up, you know, end up redesigning the kitchen. I use a style palette for that. That's kind of fun. You guys building any style palettes? Yeah, I'll come in here and pick one of mine. Might do, um, I mean, if we're doing ultra modern on this job, I don't know, it's getting a little little dated to di just do the slabs, right? Slab door, everything. Don't even need a style palette for that. I wonder if you guys picked up, I think a couple of you guys watched that um, Chief Experts live the other day, uh, last Friday. Um, and we were doing a little bit of um, color coding, work around stuff. So I'll change this to room designation, change all these to slab. Haven't figured out how to unpallet. I I show you how to do that. That's fine. That's a good one. <laughs> all right. Uh, how you unpallet, you have to go in, get your boxes, get everything. Um, talking about unpalleting, it's a good, I guess that's a term. <laughs> you have to go in, select your boxes, and set everything to default. That's it. Then save it to a new palette. Yeah, save it to a new palette. And then you call it your revert to default palette. So that's actually in my kitchen toolbars, um, my kitchen quick tools is there's the very first item is uh, revert to default so you can refer everything in the room back to, to a default cabinet look at that but it also reverts it back to its default size and everything too so you can change that parameter on the fly if you need to but it'll take it back to your default doors your default materials everything it takes it back to default everything so um so when you're creating that tool just Pretty much could select everything but width, height, and depth, and it will revert 
base configuration, your door styles, your hardware styles, all that stuff back to default. So I'm going to do yeah, a couple things. I might just do an ash wood color. This just helps me envision while I'm doing some design work. Um, don't particularly like the design here, so I'm going to end up totally redesigning. I will say it's hard to design for me when we're doing, um, when I've got the screen size pumped up so weird like this. My screen real estate is like itty bitty. But yeah, I like to color code, uh, make sure that the grains, you know, kick in the right way. Helps me also envision if I can see kind of what's happening in the room. I know this is a kitchen, so if I really want to to do some design and not worry about this this whole color coding thing. Um, might go in here and just delete this and set it back to a drywall or something. Helps me see. Um, he's got a paneled, he doesn't have a panel fridge, doesn't look like, but he's got fridge assembly. What has he got here? 30 inch refrigerator column. Oh, he's got two call. Yeah, so he's got some built-ins here, 18-inch freezer column. So it's going to be probably like a sub-zero unit thing. Um, Doug, do you have my kitchen tools? Because it's already there. It's already in there. All you'd have to do is um, unselect uh, the width box and the depth box in the selections. Um, so I'm probably going to build this custom out of a custom, two custom stacks. Instead of using my refrigerator quick tool, we'll use a full height cabinet. And probably get into the Sub-Zero catalog. Lost all my catalogs. This isn't good. So I'm going to be held up here. Without my cloud service syncing, I'm not, I don't have access to my catalogs. That's a pain. Let's see here. Let's see if we can't get around that. Probably not. Let's see. Assets, catalog. Oh, that did work. Ha. Huh. Integrated column. It's an 18. What did he say it was? What was this? Yeah, the toolbar, um, no lie, man. That's an accomplishment in and of itself. I get a lot of uh, comments from people that have purchased those tools saying they feel really accomplished after they built the toolbar. It's a bit of work, huh? <laughs> uh, I know it. I wish we had a way of transferring toolbars. We, we don't still. So hopefully we'll get there. Um, I've been back and forth with some of those guys. I'm thinking about going to Chief Architect in August. Um, they have some advanced classes that Kind of don't feel like I need at this point, but maybe, maybe I'll be pleasantly surprised. So I'm thinking about spending the bucks on it. It's like a thousand dollars on top of airfare and hotel and all that. So uh, kind of an expensive venture, but um, okay. So they have this column, but it's not a symbol that can be dropped in, which I like to fix stuff like this. Um, so I might just copy this to my user catalog. And then we can change the symbol classification. Open symbol. And we'll say in our options block, this is going to uh, inserts into cabinet front. Inserts into cabinet front. We might need to change the offset by the depth of the symbol. So we'll come in here and copy the depth of the symbol, throw it in that Y offset. Um, and I might need to adjust it for the front door. 
assembly. This looks like it's supposed to look like a pan already. I mean, a flush integrated pool. Yeah. All right. So might subtract three inches from this. Um, I will definitely be at IBS and chief is always up at IBS. So that's in, um, that's in Vegas. That's in uh, late January, early February. Going to be there. Um, I will probably spend a decent amount of time with Dan Bowman's crew. Um, they're going to be getting a big Airbnb out there. So um, even if you're not interested in his courses, by the way, I now have an affiliate link. I could actually make money if I reference you to his system. That's cool. Maybe I should drop one of those in here somewhere. Um, that's, he's got a really generous setup for, for people like me. So anyways, um, even if you're not interested in his courses, once you're done with the class portion of it, when you're on location, um, you get to you get to hang out with us, whoever's in the house. So you might have 12 people in there, varying different experience levels. Uh, all just hanging out in the house. And a lot of times they're doing some work uh, on site in the evening as they feel like it, something to do. And you get to come out and hub over and ask questions and meet new people. It's, I don't know. It's kind of cool. Um, and we play games. It's fun. All right. So change the symbol class of this so that it can be a built in so that now that I have this in my library, I can just click on the front of this cabinet. And we might need to do some edits from there. So we'll see what happens. Um, looks like I didn't do anything anything great with this. So what happened? Let's see. Got the new walls tool set up. And while setting that up, I learned a lot about the toolbar that I should have already known. Hey, toolbars are fun. They're finding they're a pain in the butt at the same time. Um, it's an old system that they haven't done a lot of updating to. I can't wait till they do some updating for it. Um, all right, so I need to figure out why this isn't popping into here. We don't seem to see that appliance popping in. And we didn't get a notification that the appliance is too big for the cabinet. So who knows what's happening there? Yeah, it is a good time. And it's really fun to see the new industry stuff. It's great to meet some um, new people that are using Chief. You get some of the real super pros, uh, power users over at the Chief booth that just hang out. I oftentimes hang out there after I've toured all, all of the other new items in, in, the, in the showrooms. Um, I'll hang out and just meet people, give them some responses, give them some answers. It's good. Um, networking. I make some money off of it. I make some new connections out of it. And then also I learn a lot. So it's a good setup. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, it's huge. It's really is. I mean, that's how I met Dan. I was in um, at Chief Experts. I was at his one that was in Vegas post COVID. He, I was in town. He invited me to come meet him. I hadn't, I hadn't met him. So he invited me to come join uh, them at their Airbnb for a night. I hung out I met uh, his family tours with him. Um, and they were in the kitchen cooking, having a good time, having a blast. Everybody was out playing cars, having a good time. And then walk around the house and meet a bunch of people working on their, on their various projects. Really cool setup. So great idea. I had never thought about that. I understood um, let me take it off the main cam for a second. So just talk to you guys. Um, I, had, I understood the curriculum part of it, which I don't know. Sometimes I can be arrogant about my knowledge of the software, even though I seem to be learning every day still, uh, was that I didn't think I needed to go to some kind of, um, something where you're, you know, learning in an instruction based classroom. But, um, the best part about going and doing that is the the time in between uh, because that's when you're just hanging out and you're just talking shop with industry folk. And that's, that's hard to come by. You know, you can't just cultivate that stuff. So he's got a system in place that just feeds into that, um, that kind of group setting. Uh, so yeah, it's really cool. It's a really 
great thing to experience. Just like I'm working here on my computer, that's what's happening in his house. Um, and he gets these really expensive houses because they have to accommodate 14, 15 people with a conference room. So he's getting cool mansions um, that have pools and all, you name it. And then on top of that, you're if you're doing the IBS in Vegas, um, you get to go meet all those cool vendors. They're doing new stuff. You know, see the cutting edge tech. I love seeing, this is a funny one for me, but for some reason I'm obsessed with all the miniature appliances that are coming out that are super efficient and crazy and cool. So we have new tools for making really gorgeous looking small spaces be completely functional. I'm, I'm big into that stuff. So I love going to IBS for that. I love seeing all the new tile finishes, um, all the guest speakers. Um, you get a lot of um, kind of industry famous people in there. Um, Cambria always has, or Caesar Stone always has someone come and speak and that's a fun event and it's a good time. Anyways, all right, let's get back to work. Okay, so what am I doing wrong? We changed the classification. Let me just make sure that it's stuck. Can you hear the birds playing behind me? Pictures there. Oops, change the symbol class again. Get symbol class. This should insert into cabinet front. Insert into cabinet front. And so why isn't it doing it? That's my next question. This might be a effort not worth doing right now. It doesn't seem to do anything. It's not giving me any warnings either. So let me open up a new plan and see what's going on here. Let's get into our full height cabinet. Tap in insert. That's what I wanted. So let's try that in our overhead view. Insert into yeah, that is not doing it. I don't know why. Interesting. Let's just take this, copy, and paste hold and grab where this is. Let's see how far off center he is. Here's our center line. You need to know where your center line of a model is when you're picking it up from someone else. It's not always uh, where it should be. All right, so that did what it's supposed to do. So we got an 18 inch unit. I love how he shoves all these things up against the wall. Like you can actually open a refrigerator into a wall like this without like a crazy offset hinge. Also just the liability, the door handle hits the wall, like all that stuff. And he's got this wall alignment issue here. And then he's got some weird doorway thing he's missing a bunch of little fixes to do in this um so the easiest way to do this now since we realize there's some weirdness going on well you guys should see the size of the bee that's walking on my keyboard right now this stone cold killer unaffected by it and this thing is it's huge costa rica okay so I'll copy paste this in place and what did he say we had we had a 18 inch and 18 inch freezer. Okay. And then 30 inch reefer. Um, do I care that they don't aren't built from the same symbol? Yeah, let's just build them from the same symbol. We're just going to duplicate this guy and then open them up, set them to 30 inches. Might need to fix the stretch planes first. so that you don't stretch that pretty little handle they've got there. There we go. Let's go negative four, something like that. And now I can open this bad boy up 30 inches. Oh, shit, it's on me. <laughs> I 
It's starting to look like something. Still a pain in the butt to find the center center point of, a, of an object. I don't know if maybe I'm not doing something right for that. It's always been difficult to like get that center just dead on to do that reflect about. And I must have bumps turned off because they're not bumping right. Nope, I don't have bumps turned off. Anybody else notice the bumps act kind of funny in Chief uh, X14? All right, there we got our full refrigerator column set up the way it was intended, probably more or less. I might actually put vents in the bottom or do a zero toe. Oh, and look, he's got no room next to his window. These things are slammed. Bizarre. At least an inch or two. Let's go three inches back. These are probably all 24s. Yeah, I feel like the... See it, Ethan. Yeah, I feel like the bumps are doing something weird, too. This guy also never um, makes it so that you can land your countertop um, up against the tower. Isn't that a funny thing? Stick with it, but that is not how I design these things. How's it going, Caesar? Come, you're coming in late. I'm actually getting getting to the point of taking a big fat break. Let's see. Let's raise these up now. <laughs> that's cool. I, I, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> All right. So we're getting more towards a modern set. Let's do some concealed hinges. Or finger poles. Maybe I'm going to call them finger poles. These are the only projects that as I go through, uh, when I run into some something that should be improved, I take the time and improve it. So these finger poles should be... I want to show them in my browser, and then I want to add a couple of uh, tags. Um, and I also don't use all caps anymore for stuff like this. So... I'm going to conform to my new standard finger cab pull ups. Finger pull. Upward facing. And then I want to add search attributes. So if you right click on your library item, add some search attributes. Here we're going to type in RAB. We're going to type in RD handle. We're going to type in RD hardware, we're going to type in RD pull, and then pull hardware again, handle, and then concealed. And then I'll shift select everything, copy it, and add these to these other items. Finger pull downward. Okay. 
guys mess around with the new hardware stuff we can do um, in 14. That stuff's cool. So I'm going to set this to room. So we're going to change all this hardware in the room. And then you can open up an individual cabinet and change some offsets in the hardware designation on a door and drawer by door and drawer basis. Or I might just get in here and do it this way. So uh, door handle in from edge is going to be eighth inch. And we're going to do down from maybe like five inches, something like that. And the drawer is going to be distance from top is eighth. Maybe even more in quarter inch. So quarter inch. Here we go. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> All right. So now that I have this, this one cabinet, I can do my object painter, select this, and uh, designate what I want. And I'm going to clear all, and I'm going to look for our hardware, or excuse me, our handle, door, drawer. I can select all found. So select found, door, drawer, handle, hardware, found. Select to uh, room painter mode and paint the room. And it should give me nothing, nothing useful. <laughs> Uh, what else did I need to get here? Um, let's see, hardware. Nope, not hardware. What was it? Door handle, door handle, door handle, horizontal position, quarter inch offset, door handle in from edge. Yeah, so what is the room painter mode not working? Or is it just that? Yeah, what's going on there? Let's try this again. Object painter, grab this, paint the room. Nothing's happening. So we might have to go object by object, which is funny. Yeah, lame. For some reason, that's another glitch I'm finding. I wonder if you guys run into that same thing. I might have to test that before I send it in. Uh, part of being on the beta team, which is a pain in the butt, is I actually do have to go take the time and report these issues I run into. Um, not always fun. But the benefit comes through when you get the polished software and it's got all the fixes you need. So worth it in the end. A lot of people will not report. They don't take the time to report. It's something I do. Um, one of the other users grilled me on that one time. Just says, man, you run into a lot of problems more than other. Uh, you got to report them or they'll never get fixed. Look at that terrible dishwasher symbol. Get out of here. Get out of here. There we go. Better. Better, better, better. Who's he got it here? Alignment issues in his stuff here. What the heck you got going on, buddy? Look at this. Doesn't snap anything. Where's that cabinet next to it? Let's see. It's got no module lines turned on. Let's do that. Can't see anything without these. All right, what's happening? There's a break in the cabinets because these aren't lined up. Why not? Who knows? But working on a diagonal is tough in the software. It doesn't always do what you want it to do. It's 
all lined up now. Oops. So he's got a table here. He's got some kind of wine fridge is supposed to be in here. Here's another issue. This won't insert into. You guys ever built your own wine cooler before? It's actually kind of cool. Kind of cool to do it yourself. Um, you can do a pretty detailed one just by using custom built shelves that have wine bottles in them and then custom doors that look like refrigerator doors. They're kind of cool. Maybe I'll do that. I'll put that together and sell that for like 15 bucks. And just a pre done one. You guys probably like that. There we go, wine cooler. I like to kill the toe kick on these symbols. Or you got to mess around with the toe kick a little bit. Looks like it's not quite a delete because that looks like it's. Oh, man. All right. Yeah, yeah, delete. There we go. Why on earth would you have doors underneath this? Who knows? Um, all right, so we need to add this to the kitchen tools. So if you guys bought the kitchen tools, you'll see an update. I'm going to add this one. This one's for sure happening. So let's just make this a panel front, just auto panel front. No reason why we shouldn't have this. So side panel applied. Yeah. There we go. Simple as that. Panel front. So we're going to create new paneled front, panel front. Okay, panel, panel front. Oh, you know what I have to type in first? Wraps. Panel front. Branding, baby. Branding. And we're just going to copy face configuration. That's it. So there we go, we got a panel front cab. I'm gonna have to sort that later. And then the next one I love using in my tool is push that toe kick forward flush. There's no reason the toe kick should be there. So the panel front should be able to apply to this and then push the toe kick forward. And I don't understand what the hell is happening here. Looks like these are facing. What do you think the intent was here? <laughs> What's he even doing here? Let's just make these all panel fronts, I guess. I don't know why you wouldn't have storage here. It doesn't make sense not to have storage here. So we'll do a full height door. Um, but I don't want that toe kick, so we'll have this all lined up. What do you think the icon should look like for a panel front? I think I know. I think I know what I want to do. Let's fire up Photoshop. We're going to do it now. Finish it. Finish it. Get it out to people. I like this workflow. You you stop, you fix the things that need to be fixed, you make some tools in the meantime, the tools make your life easier. And then before you know it, you have a catalog of things that make your life easier and they hold value. Okay, what do we have in here? Let's see, we've got some kitchen tools, kitchen quick tools, and it should be some icons. There we go. Oh, and we don't have, oh, we don't have my cloud service turned on, so I'm not gonna be able to 
get these. So we're going to have to build this from maybe scratch. Uh, we'll build it from Chief's icons then. If you didn't know where Chief's icons were, we can. if you're on a PC, percentage sign program files. How do I do this? Percentage sign program files in the forward slash. Oh, I don't want to see. Program files. Chief architect. Okay. What? Oh, interesting. You don't want to give me access. Okay. I need to work on that. It's in resources, buttons. And we'll shrink these down a little bit so we can see where that base cabinet is. I'm going to use a base cabinet, this guy right here. What did you want to rewind on? Can you type it out? All right. So this is going to open up that icon. And I have some library stuff built in that gives me the right color um, colors for Chief. Have that saved to a library. So this is how I make icons. People sometimes ask how we make icons. Um, the libraries tab in Photoshop is linked to the internet. So satellite internet, a little bit slow to get to. Um, but there you go. I got the chief icon colors. I have a particular brush I have built for this, um, which makes life a lot easier. Um, so use the brush tool and I'm going to select this color and I'm going to shrink my brush way down. Oh, make sure that I'm picking the right brush. I want my square brush. There we go. That's what I want right there. So I'll kind of blank this out using just shift. And then for the panel front, switch that red color. And we'll probably just replace this outside line completely because that's kind of the standard chief goes by um, in their icons if you study their icons. So that's that first part of it. And then we'll just kind of dupe this. In fact, we could just copy this and, and transform it. So we can copy this, this first one might even make a, I like making layers. So control J and make a new layer, control T to modify that and then shift and then alt will bring it in from center. And that looks like a panel icon. I think, I think that looks perfect. So there you go. And then I want to export this. Um, I do want to erase something. I don't know how I got this little black section down here at the bottom. There we go. There it is. Um, oh, that's the drop down for the tool palette menu. Um, so uh, from here, Control Shift W, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and you know what? I saw a couple little discrepancies. I hit my G key for the paint bucket tool and paint this so that it gets rid of that black. There's a little bit of black in there. There we go. So control shift alt W and then make sure I'm exporting as a PNG 128 by 128. And we want to take this to a known folder, which is going to be my catalog kitchen quick tools. And I'm going to make an update folder. Um, two, two, oh, five, two, three update. And we're going to call this abs panel. Now, this points out an issue that I have in my quick tools package in that I was naming everything with a prefix um, in order to kind of help you build out the toolbar. But here we go. We've got 
a new tool that needs to be incorporated for people that are purchasing as new purchasers. And I'm going to have to fix this so that it's like a dot one to be able to place that panel um, tool in the middle of this run. Right. So i um, obviously going to do my customized toolbars place library object. Um, I would love it if everybody knew how to do this. Um, if they haven't watched this video yet, you should be watching that video um, that I have on the site for placing library objects. So place library object, and now we're going to get a panel tool in here right next to the double door. And Rob's panel front, I need to get this into the appropriate place. But for now, it's fine because I can link it to this item and I can still rename the item in the library and reorganize its location so long as I'm not um, duplicating it to, in a, some other way, right? So I want to make sure that it's conforming to the look and feel of my other tools. But for now, I'm just going to link it and then conform that look and feel a little bit later. So uh, link this up to my library item. Even though it's not organized and not standardized, it will retain the, this link. And then we're going to browse for that new icon I created. And when you browse for an icon, keep in mind, Chief will automatically pull this into your toolbars folder uh, within um, where, wherever you have it set to be you know, located. So. I think I put it in here, did I not? Maybe I didn't. Did I forget to, to put place it in here? Oh, I did. PNG export. Where did I put it? Catalog quitching. Oh, oh, I put it in the update folder. Duh. Okay. I don't see an update folder. Where did that go? Oh, here. Ha. Ha. And look at that. It's up there. Right now, there it is. Here's our panel tool, bam. All right, moving on. So what else about this kitchen? Something else needs to change. Boy, I would love to move those windows over just a hair, right? Center them up in between. This just doesn't look good. So we're gonna have to move both of these over. And we're on a diagonal, so that's always challenging. Yeah. So I hear some family coming back in. I'm going to say we're going to do this feed for 10 more minutes, and then it's time to take a break. So uh, just here's your 10-minute warning. <laughs> ask, ask me any questions you'd like to know. Because you, you got 10 minutes. Hey, Nicholas. Thanks for joining in. Thanks for chiming in. I love it when people chime in. All right, so that's a little bit better. I'm not going to worry about just how centered this is. Let's throw a backsplash in here. Um, I would figure that this would be just a beautiful slab backsplash. Um, we've got some issues with overlapping in the lowers. That's fine. Probably change these. I mean, I like more of a, a modern looking field. Maybe a, a two drawer, double two drawers. I might want to change our reveals so that they're a little more pronounced in rendering. I uh, might want to change all of them, in fact. So uh, you can always use restrictive selection uh, using your upper cabinet tool. Oops. So upper cabinet tool, cool restrictive selection, open this up, get into our, um, our box construction, and let's change our overlay to 3 16 And that's going to give us, 3 16 I find is, is the best for giving us a noticeable gap um, in our cabinets. so that the shadows act accordingly. There you go, just a little bit bigger of a gap than you might actually see in the real world, but this is gonna make it better in our rendering. Uh, oh, 
always way brighter than it should be after drop the lumens it's like 20 for most normal light sources or it becomes blinding in pbr well are you doing pbr or ray trace pbr um would be my first question and to 20 20 is very 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 low um lumens huh okay oops So we have a light here. What do we have here? Let's give you, let's start with, you're saying you're going to 20 lumens. Is this a rope lighting? If it's just a regular light at 20, that's pretty crazy. So it must be something, must be something in your um, rendering send it, settings is what I'd say. Or are you just trying to render one scene and you don't have lights turned on anywhere else? Chief acts differently based on that path tracer acts differently based on that um the other thing i would say is get into your rendering technique options uh and in your physically based ray trace take a look at a couple settings there uh, you might need to change your camera exposure mine's at 0.18 um, to start with and i adjust from there um, my brightness is at negative 48 so maybe that's helpful um yeah could be many things as you said I mean, this is this is not my template. So out of the box, this looks okay. A, a big trip trick I give people um, is you might have your drop off rate set too low. I don't know if these are custom fixtures you're using or not. Um, but get in, open up one of your um, one of your lights. Actually, I'm realizing that negative forty eight is not my setting. That's someone else's setting. This isn't my template, so I have to pull up my templates real quick. But um, and also when we're ray tracing, the encoder speed ends up lagging. Uh, but something I like to do is set my light to a bright red. And that way we can see what it's doing to the scene. If it's affecting the scene in the way that we would like it to. Um, in this case, not really affecting anything yet as it rebuilds. Let me actually uh, stop this ray trace. We'll get into my template so we have something uh, known to deal with. So... Pull up my template plan. Let's kill this browser in Aldo. And we'll drop some lights in here. Oops. Let's drop in, I don't know, three by four grid. Sure. And let's pull in a camera. Okay, so with no window in the scene, which is kind of rare, um, pull a PBR. Here's what we're looking like. And we can see I've got, yeah, I've got brightness set to zero. I've got camera exposure 0.25. Um, so nothing special there. And then pulling up the light itself. Um, We'll show you what we've got 1200 lumens so not low um but the cutoff angle and i have these in a couple recent videos on chief experts but the cutoff angle uh, directly corresponds with your drop off rate the greater the uh, value of the cutoff angle should be um the less lesser value of your drop off rate if that helps um, and then the next thing I like to do is, like I said, change that color so that you can see what's happening. So let's just show an example. We're going to bring up the adjust lights tool. We'll select all these lights. By the way, you can sort. I don't know if you guys knew this, but when you use the adjust lights tool, this came up the other day, you can actually sort based on column so that um, you can sort this based on a room. You can sort it based on the floor. And then you can even sort a second column um, based on that first sort. If that makes sense. I'll have to get into that another time. The other way to do this, by the way, is I love I love this because sometimes it's cumbersome to go through and, and pick all this stuff. It is sometimes I will instead just drop a schedule in here. So our Alt T S for schedules and then an electrical schedule picture is uh oh is e oops e so alt t s e drop an electrical schedule and if 
you have this sorted down to no rooms or anything like that or you could sort it by room if you want to if you only wanted to select just the items in a, in a room you can come in here and just add that room room name here and that's going to change that sort order so that if we have another uh, room next to this right and we've uh, we've got this set up and then we've got a light in here all right, we're going to get an additional uh, heading. Oh, that's right. Our stylo palettes don't pick up room types yet. Another glitch. All right, so this is a bath. There we go. So now I can select in my schedule and then open this from the schedule. So I can open all those lights up very quickly this way if you have that set up as like a default uh, tool for your schedules. Uh, change this to a red light. Get in, in into our our PBR view and we should see we should see red we don't see red I don't know why what's going on here oh because I picked the first one ha there we go now we'll do red but this to me is helpful when you've got other light sources and you're trying to just figure out what one lights doing right and look how much ambient light we get from these lights isn't that crazy So that when we bring in new light sources, look how much of that ambient light disappears. Kind of cool. Nice to know. Thanks, Chief, for telling us. No process documentation on that. That's just guessing and checking and playing around. So a couple things to, to check out. You can see it's, you know, it's hitting the walls. If I want to um, change that drop off rate. Let's take a look. When we change this to like a one value, you're going to see a hard line on the wall. See that? But if we narrowed our cone, our beam spread, which is named cutoff angle to something like 40 degrees, you're going to see that hard line kind of soften up a little bit, but you're going to get more of a narrow cone. But the hard line ends up showing up on the floor. So if we increase now our drop off rate, now we're going to get a soft line on the floor. So check this out. I'm going to do a narrow cone to get concentrated light on the floor. We're going to increase our drop off rate to something like 40. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another light. We'll make this a blue light. And I'm going to increase my cutoff angle to 160. And I'm going to change my drop off rate back down to that like three or something like that. Now we've got a two part light. A lot more calculations going on, but a little bit more of a dynamic um, lighting system. So that if we delete one of these windows, see what it's doing to the room. See, we're getting some soft ambient light from the blue with that heavy drop off rate. And we're just getting a little bit of it on the walls. And then we're getting hard light from those red lights. And you can see it's might need to be rebuilt because we're only getting some of those sharp cones. Um, I think we're getting a big update to Emory, which is um, the platform that Chief uses for their ray trace stuff. Oh, I have a max lights here. We'll change it to the default light set. There we go. Now we're now we see what's happening. So there's our soft light on the wall and there's our hard light on the ground, all from one fixtures, right? One single fixtures. So kind of cool stuff, cool info. It's a good one. Come back to that. Um, all right, guys, I'm going to sign off. Good, good session. Didn't get much done. <laughs> Had an earthquake. <laughs> Had a bug. Uh, and uh, anyways, thanks for engaging with me. Appreciate you guys watching. 
if you're seeing this after the fact, you got questions, hit me up. It was a kind of a goofy session, but yeah, we'll get back to it. So these are the red circles. The red circles were, um, there's two light sources per light. One light source had a narrow um, drop off rate, a small value, which is like 60, uh, excuse me, had a high drop off rate, 30, had a narrow um, directional angle. So what the hell is it called? It should be called beam spread. Had a narrow cutoff angle. So the first light, the red spots, narrow cutoff angle, high drop off rate. Okay. The blue on the wall was high cutoff angle, low drop off rate. There you go. And yes, I will. <laughs> Talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, guys.